Hey guys, I'm back with another 3D printer review. This time it's the FLSUN S1, which is, to my knowledge, the fastest consumer 3D printer that you can buy. And I've had this unit for the last two weeks and I've been printing mainly nylon, polycarbonate and ABS on it. And overall, I think it's quite a good printer and I thought I would do something a little bit different and rather than take you through all of the tech specs, which you can get on any other video on YouTube, I'm just gonna take you through my real world experience with it, what I liked, what I didn't like and who I think the printer is best suited for. A big thank you to my friends at 3D Printing Perth for loaning me the S1 for review. This machine is going back to their shop at the end of the week and I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to play with it. I highly recommend you check them out. I'll put a link in the description below. Okay, let's start with the positives and I'm gonna begin with speed because the S1 markets itself on its speed and I think it absolutely lives up to the claims. The tool head is insanely fast. When it's printing, it just looks like it's vanishing and reappearing in other parts of the print bed. It is just insanely, insanely fast. And the flow rate, it's advertised at 120 cubic millimeters per second. In my testing with high-speed ABS, I was able to achieve 111 cubic millimeters per second, which is a couple of digits short of the claimed 120, but look, 111 cubic millimeters per second is insanely fast. With PETG and PLA, we're getting numbers in the high 60s to high 70s, depending depending on the material. Uh, if you have a look at this graph, you'll see that the typical consumer 3D printers hover at around the 25 to 30 range, and then the FLSUN printers really take a step above those. The V400, which I reviewed about a year ago, takes it up to 40. The T1 that I reviewed a couple of months ago hit 90, and today with the S1, I'm seeing 111, which is really good. Taking a little bit of a step back now, I wanna talk about the packaging, which I think FSN did really well. The printer comes pretty much completely assembled, so it's in a gigantic box and it weighs 48 kilos. So when I saw those stats, I was pretty concerned about how I'd get it into the house, but it turns out with two people, it's actually a really straightforward job. And the packaging did a really good job of protecting the printer. The box that I got actually had a big tear on the corner, so something happened with the courier, but everything inside was absolutely perfect and I can't fault FLSUN at all on their packaging. Assembly is also really straightforward. All you have to do is attach the screen the doors and the doorknobs and the printer is good to go. Everything else is pretty much fully automated. There is a automatic prompt to do a software update and I really enjoyed that once the software update was complete that it prompted you to redo the bed mesh and the vibration compensation as well. The build quality of the S1 is really good. Everything fits together nicely. It looks really good. And also all of the plastic panel gaps are really flush. It's a really big improvement from the cheaper T1. And I also enjoyed that there's these integrated handles on the back panels. Aside from the print speeds being really high, I also found that the nozzle and the bed heated up really fast, which is really important because the bed goes up to 120 degrees and the nozzle goes up to 350, compared to the printers behind me, which really take ages to even hit 70 degrees on the bed. The S1 just jumps up to 100 degrees before you even know it. Let's do a little speed test now of how the nozzle and bed heat up. And I've got the S1 next to the Creality K1C, which I think is a very competent printer. And I've got them both preheating for ABS. So 260 degrees on the nozzle and 100 degrees on the bed. And eagle-eyed viewers would have seen that I gave the Creality K1C a tiny little head start, uh, maybe a second. And so far we can see that the nozzles are heating up about the same. We're at about 140 degrees on both. If we look at the beds, the S1 is racing ahead. It's already at 60 degrees. The K1C just at 34 at the moment. So we're gonna let this play out a little bit longer. The nozzle on the S1 is starting to heat up a little bit ahead of the K1C now, really stretching its legs. Before you know it, the S1 is going to be done with its nozzle and the bed is not far behind. All right, so 55 seconds, the S1 nozzle was at temperature. The K1C not too far behind there, actually. A minute and eight seconds. Now, if we compare the beds, we can see the S1 is just about at 99 degrees now, the K1C at 47 degrees. And this is where you get a lot of time savings with the S1. We have the S1 fully at temperature at about a minute and 20 seconds. And this is with ABS temperatures, that's 260 degrees and 100 on the bed, which is pretty high. If you're printing PLA or PETG, uh, this is way higher than you would be uh, setting your printer stats to. 
but uh, look at the K1C, it's still not even ready for PLA. The bed is at 54 degrees. And I thought about running this in real time so you could actually sort of sit there and twiddle your thumbs and wait for the K1C. But you know what? I'm not that mean to you guys. I'm gonna speed it up along here and you're gonna see that it finally, finally comes up to temperature at five minutes and 24 seconds. So compare that to the S1, which was at about one minute 20. You're saving four minutes in heating time alone. And for printing one-offs, that's probably not a big deal. But if you're prototyping and you're going through five prototypes to get to your final design, that's 20 minutes. It is a big time saving having such an efficiently well heating printer. I think the lighting of the S1 is really well done. There's two LED panels, one on the left, one on the right. And compared to the cheaper T1, which you couldn't really see through the tinted glass front, the S1 is completely bright enough inside that you can just walk past and see exactly what's happening inside. The Wi-Fi connection on the S1 is really good. I had no trouble sending really large G-code files through and the transfer speeds were also really good. It's noticeably faster than the T1, which I did find had slightly slow upload speeds with the Wi-Fi, but the S1 is really quick. I like the webcam implementation on the S1. It's a really wide angle lens and it's actually portrait orientation, which means you see the entire width of the bed and you also see right up into the top of the printer as well. The frame rate is pretty good. It's about 10 frames per second. I think Evelson did a really good job with the webcam implementation. And another thing I really like about the S1 is how stable it is. So the unit is quite heavy, which means that when the tool head is zipping around really fast, it's really stable, it doesn't rock at all. I actually have mine sitting on a rolling filing cabinet, which is not typically the way that I would recommend you guys use these at home, but I had zero issues with stability. I think that Evelson built a really solid tank of a printer, which is very stable. Now onto some of the things that I didn't like so much about the S1 and the first one is that there's no live flow adjustments. So while you're printing on the touch screen, you can adjust live Z and speed, but you can't adjust flow. I find live flow tuning really useful because if I'm walking past the print and I can see that it's over extruding a little bit, I can just dial back the flow by one or 2% and be pretty confident that it's gonna continue nicely. With the S1, the flow is locked in with your slicer G code. And if you do see that it's over extruding, your options are either to cancel the print and start again, or try your luck and see what happens with the finished product. And you can see with this print here that I tried the latter and it resulted in these blobs on the top surface, which would have been avoidable if I was able to do some live flow adjustment. The S1 is capable of printing some pretty challenging materials like nylon and carbon fiber filaments. It does have a hardened steel nozzle that goes up to 350 degrees, but I found one of the challenges was getting enough chamber temperature. There isn't an active chamber heater, so you're relying on the bed and the nozzle to warm things up. And because it's so big, there's just a lot of air to heat up. Also, because of the size, you can't just throw a blanket over the top of it. There's also an air inlet for the cooling fan on top of the printer. And I found that the highest chamber temperature I was able to achieve was 47 degrees, and that was in a really warm room. So if you're in a room that's running air conditioning or in a cooler climate, I think you're gonna to top out at a chamber temperature of about 40 degrees or so, versus something a lot smaller like my K1C, if I throw a blanket over the top of that, I can easily get 60 degree chamber temperatures in there, which is my target chamber temperature when printing things like nylon and polycarbonate. One thing I found interesting with the S1 was that it can handle some of the really challenging filaments, but I had no luck with TPU at all. With one of them, I got a clog midway through, and with another brand of TPU, I couldn't even get it to extrude. The extruder would take a bite and then bunch up with the filament, and I just couldn't get that one to run through the nozzle at all. TPU also doesn't feed nicely through the long PTFE tube of the standard filament path. So I had both doors open and just fed the tool head directly from the overhead spool. In my short time with the S1, it seemed like the TPU was a bit problematic overall. If you've had any luck with TPU in the S1, please let me know in the comments. Uh, it's just something that I wasn't able to get working. The inbuilt filament dryer is effective. It only goes up to 60 degrees though, so it's more of a filament dry maintainer rather than something that you would use to actively pull the moisture out of the filament. I would use a dedicated filament dryer for that. Uh, but it is a bit fiddly because it's quite a tight space. And if you watch the video here with me trying to load the silk PLA, I wasn't actually hamming this up for the video. I was just having a really hard time.
The space is a bit too tight to have both the spool and your fingers in the same space. And with springy filaments, it's really, really easy to accidentally have them spring apart and possibly tangle. Loading filaments definitely needs to be done with care to avoid tangles. I also don't like that the official procedure for removing filament is to manually disconnect the PTFE tube from the tool head, cut the filament with a snipper, and then purge everything that's still in the tool head. It's quite labor intensive and also wasteful of filament. I would have preferred a basic automatic heat and retract system. I mentioned before that I like the design of the webcam, it's really good for monitoring prints, but the time-lapse function on the S1 I could not get working. This is the most successful time-lapse video I got out of the printer and it only went through about half of the print. And for nine out of 10 time-lapses that I started, all I got was a single frame at the start of the prints. So I had to resort to using external cameras for my time-lapses. Now it's all well and good having a printer that prints insanely fast, but one of the side effects is noise and pollution. So I know that FL Sun released the S1 Pro, which has a quieter fan. I didn't have a chance to test that. So with the regular S1, just like with the T1, I definitely recommend you using hearing protection when you're working in the same room when it's printing at high speeds. When printing at slow speeds, the noise is completely fine. But if you're using the S1 for its intended purpose, you're probably going to be running it at its default print speeds, which come at about 800 millimeters per second, and it's loud. But more than that, it's the pollution. So when you melt filament, even on something a bit slower, like what's behind me, it stinks. You can smell it. It's a bit uncomfortable on the chest. But when you're melting filament five to six times faster, it can really quickly overwhelm the air purifiers in the room. And for me, I found that when printing something like ABS or polycarbonate, it was really quite choking. And I'm not even joking here, I was using this respirator when working in the same room as the S1 just to look after my lung health. I think if you're planning to use the S1 for really high speed printing, it really should be in a workshop or a shed. I don't think that the S1 is particularly well suited for use in a home environment, at least if you're planning to use it for its intended purpose, which is really rapid fire printing. The build volume on the S1 is reasonable. It's a 320mm diameter cylinder, and on paper it sounds a fair bit bigger than a standard size bed like on this Neptune 4, which is 220 by 220 But the thing is, you have to remember that on the diagonal, this standard bed is about 310mm. So for something long and skinny like this, you can actually print this diagonally on a standard bed, and you can see that on the S1, it pretty much maxes out the diameter of the bed as well. This is one of the challenges with a round print surface. The stated diameter is as big as you're gonna get. And the final consideration for the S1 is its size. Now, I've gotten used to the size of Delta printers, but there's no getting around the fact that this is quite large. And it's a bit of an unfair perspective for you guys at the moment because the S1 is quite a bit in front of these other printers. So I'll just get it back in line with them so you can make a fair comparison of the size of these printers. And there is no doubt that the S1 is really quite a step above in terms of the size required. Um, to be fair, each of these printers fits quite nicely on these uh, movable filing cabinets, but uh, the S1 is definitely overhanging just a little bit. Um, yeah, you're gonna have to really consider your space carefully uh, if you're trying to fit this underneath an overhead cupboard or something like that. But uh, I mean, for the print capabilities, the size versus the speed is definitely a trade-off that I think is fair if you've got the space for the printer. All that being said, I had a very successful time with the FL Sun S1 printing parts out of nylon, polycarbonate, carbon fiber polycarbonate, and ABS. I didn't actually run much PLA or PETG through the S1 because I knew it would handle them perfectly just like the T1 did. But the S1 does have the hardened steel nozzle and expanded temperature capability, which means that it can handle pretty much any filament you throw at it, except TPU, which was a surprise to me. It might have been my operator error, can't be too sure, but in my hands I just couldn't get the extruder to play nicely with TPU. I do like the S1 and I think the ideal customer would be someone who's designing prototypes and needs to rapidly print them to arrive at their final design and maybe use the S1 to produce production parts in engineering filaments like carbon fiber reinforced polycarbonate. The S1 isn't the only printer on the market that can print with exotic filaments, but it is the only one that can blast out ABS prototypes at over a thousand millimeters per second. You can get the S1 from the FL Sun website for $24.99 Australian dollars or from my friends at 3D Printing Perth for $22.79. I'll leave a link in the description below. 
But if you're not needing the bigger build volume or the engineering materials handling of the S1, the T1 is available on the FLSung website for sale now for 659 Australian dollars, which is about a third the price of the S1, and it will still print PLA and PEDG at about five to six times the speed of any other consumer printer that you can buy. Again, as a health professional, I do recommend that if you're printing at high speeds, please do it in a well-ventilated area because if you're printing at five to six times the speed of other printers, you're also releasing five to six times as many VOCs from the filament in any given time. And since these printers can print so fast, the flip side is that they can pollute your environment just as quickly. I hope this video has been informative. I do think there is a very particular type of customer that the S1 is perfect for. Please leave your thoughts in the comments below and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.